Chapter Two, Part Two of Famous American Statesmen by Sarah Knowles Bolton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Benjamin Franklin, Part Two. Into the home of the printer had come two sons, William and Francis. The second was an uncommonly beautiful child, the idol of his father. Smallpox was raging in the city, but Franklin could not bear to put his precious one in the slightest peril by inoculation. The dread disease came into the home, and Francis Folger, named for his grandmother, at the age of four years, went suddenly out of it. I long regretted him bitterly, Franklin wrote years afterwards to his sister Jane. My grandson often brings afresh to my mind the idea of my son Frankie, though now dead thirty-six years, whom I have seldom since seen equaled in every respect, and whom to this day I cannot think of without a sigh. On a little stone in Christ Church burying ground, Philadelphia, are the boy's name and age, with the words, The delight of all that knew him. This same year, when Franklin was thirty, he was chosen clerk of the General Assembly, his first promotion. If, as Disraeli said, the secret of success in life is for a man to be ready for his opportunity when it comes, Franklin had prepared himself, by study, for his opportunity. The year later, he was made deputy postmaster, and soon became especially helpful in city affairs. He obtained better watch or police regulations, organized the first fire company, and invented the Franklin stove, which was used far and wide. At thirty-seven, so interested was he in education, that he set on foot a subscription for an academy, which resulted in the Noble University of Pennsylvania, of which Franklin was a trustee for over forty years. The following year, his only daughter Sarah was born, who helped to fill the vacant chair of the lovely boy. The father, Josiah, now died at eighty-seven, already proud of his son Benjamin, for whom in his poverty he had done the best he could. About this time, the Leyden jar was discovered in Europe by Mustenbroek, and became the talk of the scientific world. Franklin, always eager for knowledge, began to study electricity with all the books at his command. Dr. Spence, a gentleman from Great Britain, having come to America to lecture on the subject, Franklin bought all his instruments. So much did he desire to give his entire time to this fascinating subject that he sold his printing house, paper, and almanac for ninety thousand dollars and retired from business. This at forty-two, and at fifteen, selling ballads about the streets. Industry, temperance, and economy had paid good wages. He used to say that these virtues, with sincerity and justice, had won for him the confidence of his country. And yet Franklin, with all his saving, was generous. The great preacher Whitefield came to Philadelphia to obtain money for an orphan house in Georgia. Franklin thought the scheme unwise, and silently resolved not to give when the collection should be taken. Then, as his heart warmed under the preaching, he concluded to give the copper coins in his pocket, then all the silver, several dollars, and finally all his five gold pistoles, so that he emptied his pocket into the collector's plate. Franklin now constructed electrical batteries, introduced the terms positive and negative electricity, and published articles on the subject, which his friend in London, Peter Collinson, laid before the Royal Society. When he declared his belief that lightning and electricity were identical, and gave his reasons, and that points would draw off electricity, and therefore lightning rods be of benefit, learned people ridiculed the ideas. Still, his pamphlets were eagerly read, and Count de Buffon had them translated into French. They soon appeared in German, Latin, and Italian. Louis the Fifteenth was so deeply interested that he ordered all Franklin's experiments to be performed in his presence, and caused a letter to be written to the Royal Society of London, expressing his admiration of Franklin's learning and skill. Strange, indeed, that such a scientist should arise in the new world, be a man self-taught, and one so busy in public life. In 1752, when he was forty-six, he determined to test for himself whether lightning and electricity were one. He made a kite from a large silk handkerchief, attached a hempen cord to it, with a silk string in his hand, and, with his son, hastened to an old shed in the fields, as the thunderstorm approached. As the kite flew upward, and a cloud passed over, there was no manifestation of electricity. When he was almost despairing, lo, the fibers of the cord began to loosen. Then he applied his knuckle to a key on the cord, and a strong spark passed. 
How his heart must have throbbed as he realized his immortal discovery. A laden jar was charged, and Franklin went home from the old shed to be made a member of the Royal Society of London, to receive the Copley Gold Medal, degrees from Harvard and Yale Colleges, and honors from all parts of the world. Ah, if Josiah Franklin could have lived to see his son come to such renown! And Abiah, his mother, had been dead just a month. But she knew he was coming into greatness, for she wrote him near the last, I am glad to hear you are so well respected in your town for them to choose you an alderman, although I don't know what it means, or what the better you will be of it besides the honor of it. I hope you will look up to God, and thank him for all his good providences towards you. Sweetest of all things is the motherhood that never lets go the hand of the child, and always points Godward. Lightning rods became the fashion, though there was great opposition, because many believed that lightning was one of the means of punishing the sins of mankind, and it was wrong to attempt to prevent the Almighty from doing His will. Some learned men urged that a ball instead of a point be used at the end of the rod, and George III insisted that the President of the Royal Society should favor balls. But, sire, said Sir John Pringle, I cannot reverse the laws and operations of nature. Then, Sir John, you had perhaps better resign, was the reply, and the obstinate monarch put knobs on his conductors. Through all the scientific discord, Franklin had the rare good sense to remain quiet, instead of rushing into print. He said, I have never entered into any controversy in defense of my philosophical opinions. I leave them to take their chance in the world. If they are right, truth and experience will support them. If wrong, they ought to be refuted and rejected. Disputes are apt to sour one's temper and disturb one's quiet. Franklin was not long permitted to enjoy his life of study. This same year, 1752, he was elected a member of the Pennsylvania Assembly, and re-elected every year for ten years, without, as he says, ever asking any elector for his vote or signifying, either directly or indirectly, any desire of being chosen. He was also, with Mr. William Hunter of Virginia, appointed Postmaster General for the Colonies, having been the Postmaster in Philadelphia for nearly sixteen years. So excellent was his judgment, and so conciliatory his manner, that he rarely made enemies, and accomplished much for his constituents. He cut down the rates of postage, advertised unclaimed letters, and showed his rare executive ability and tireless energy. For many years, the French and English had been quarreling over their claims in the New World, till finally the French and Indian War, or Seven Years' War, as it was named in Europe, began. Delegates from the various colonies were sent to Albany to confer with the chiefs of the Six Nations about the defense of the country. Naturally, Franklin was one of the delegates. Before starting, he drew up a plan of union for the struggling Americans, and printed it in the Gazette, with the now well-known woodcut at the bottom, a snake cut into as many pieces as there were colonies, each piece having upon it the first letter of the name of a colony, and underneath the words, join or die. He presented his plan of union to the delegates, who, after a long debate, unanimously adopted it, but it was rejected by some of the colonies, because they thought it gave too much power to England, and the king rejected it because he said, the Americans are trying to make a government of their own. Franklin joined earnestly in the war, and commanded the forces of his own state, but was soon sent abroad by Pennsylvania, as her agent to bring some troublesome matters before royalty. He reached London, July 27, 1757, with his son William, no longer the friendless lad looking for a position in a printing house, but the noted scientist and representative of a rising nation. Members of the Royal Society hastened to congratulate him. The universities at Oxford and Edinburgh conferred degrees upon him. While he attended to matters of business in connection with his mission, he entertained his friends with his brilliant electrical experiments and wrote for several magazines on politics and science. After five years of successful labor, Dr. Franklin went back to Philadelphia to receive the public thanks of the assembly and a gift of $15,000 for his services. His son was also appointed governor of New Jersey by the crown. Franklin was now 57 and had earned rest and the enjoyment of his honors, but he was to find little rest in the next twenty-five years. The Seven Years' War had been terminated by the Treaty of Paris, February 10, 1763. Of course, great expenses had been incurred. The following year, Mr. Greenville, Prime Minister of England, 
proposed that a portion of the enormous debt be paid by America through the Stamp Act. The colonies had submitted already to much taxation without any representation in Parliament, and had many grievances. The manufacture of iron and steel had been forbidden. Heavy duties had been laid upon rum, sugar, and molasses, and constables had been authorized to search any place suspected of avoiding the duties. When the Stamp Act was suggested, the colonies, already heavily in debt by the war, remonstrated in public meetings and sent their protests to the king. Franklin, having been reappointed agent for Pennsylvania, used all possible effort to prevent its passage, but to no avail. The bill passed in March 1765. By this act, deeds and conveyances were taxed from 37 cents to $1.25 apiece, college degrees $10, advertisements 50 cents each, and other printed matter in proportion. At once the American heart rebelled. Bells were tolled and flags hung at half-mast. In New York, the Stamp Act was carried about the streets with a placard, The Folly of England and the Ruin of America. The people resolved to wear no cloth of English manufacture. Agents appointed to collect the hated tax were in peril of their lives. Patrick Henry electrified his country by the well-known words, Caesar had his Brutus, Charles I had his Cromwell, and George III, and when the loyalists shouted, Treason, he continued, may profit by their example. If that be treason, make the most of it. Greenville saw, too late, the storm he had aroused. Franklin was now, as he wrote to a friend, extremely busy attending members of both houses, informing, explaining, consulting, disputing, in a continual hurry from morning till night. His examination before the House of Commons filled England with amazement and America with joy. When asked, if the Stamp Act should be repealed, would it induce the assemblies of America to acknowledge the rights of Parliament to tax them, and would they erase their resolutions? He replied, No, never. What used to be the pride of the Americans? To indulge in the fashions and manufactures of Great Britain. What is now their pride? To wear their old clothes over again, till they can make new ones, said the fearless Franklin. The great commoners William Pitt and Edmund Burke were our staunch friends, a cry of distress went up from the manufacturers of England, who needed American markets for their goods, and in 1766 the Stamp Act was repealed. America was overjoyed, but her joy was of short duration, for in the very next year a duty was placed on glass, tea, and other articles. Then riots ensued. The duty was repealed on all save tea. When the tea arrived in Boston Harbor, the indignant citizens threw 340 chests overboard. In Charlestown, the people stored it in cellars till it mildewed, and from New York and Philadelphia they sent it home again to Old England. In 1774, the Boston Port Bill, which declared that no merchandise should be landed or shipped at the wharfs of Boston, was received by the colonists with public mourning. September 5th of this year, the First Continental Congress met at Philadelphia, and again a manly protest was sent to George III. Again the great Pitt, Earl of Chatham, poured out his eloquence against what he saw was close at hand, a most accursed, wicked, barbarous, cruel, unjust, and diabolical war. But George III was immovable. The days for Franklin were now bitter in the extreme. Ten thousand more troops had been sent to General Gage in Boston to compel obedience. Franklin's wife was dying in Philadelphia, longing to see her husband, who had now been absent ten years, each year expecting to return, and each year detained by the necessities of the colonies. At last he started homeward, landing May 5th, 1775. His daughter had been happily married to Mr. Richard Bach, a merchant, but his wife was dead, and buried beside Frankie. The battles of Lexington and Concord had been fought, the war for freedom was indeed begun. Franklin was now almost seventy, but ready for the great work before him. He loved peace. He said, all wars are follies, very expensive and very mischievous ones. When will mankind be convinced of this and agree to settle their differences by arbitration? Were they to do it, even by the cast of a die, it would be better than by fighting and destroying each other. But now war was inevitable. With the eagerness of a boy he wrote to Edmund Burke. General Gage's troops made a most vigorous retreat, twenty miles in three hours, scarce to be paralleled in history. The feeble Americans, who pelted them all the way, could scarce keep up with them. He was at once made a member of the Continental Congress, called to meet May 10th at Philadelphia. 
George Washington and Patrick Henry, John and Samuel Adams, were in the noted assemblage. They came with brave hearts and an earnest purpose. Franklin served upon ten committees, to engrave and print continental money, to negotiate with the Indians, to send another but useless petition to George III, to find out the source of saltpeter, and other matters. He was made Postmaster General of the United States, and was also full of work for Pennsylvania. England had voted a million dollars to conquer the colonies, and had hired nearly 20,000 Hessians to fight against them, besides her own skilled troops. The army under Washington had no proper shelter, little food, little money, and no winter clothing. Franklin was Washington's friend and helper in these early days of discouragement. At first, the people had hoped to keep united to the mother country. Now the time had arrived for the Declaration of Independence, by which America was to become a great nation. Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, Roger Sherman of Connecticut, and Robert R. Livingston of New York were appointed to draw up the document. Jefferson wrote the Declaration, and Franklin and Adams made a few verbal changes, and then, with the feeling so well expressed by Franklin, we must hang together, or else, most assuredly, we shall all hang separately, the delegates fearlessly signed their names to what Daniel Webster well called the title deed of our liberties. And now another important work devolved upon Franklin. The colonies believed that the French were friendly and would assist. He was unanimously chosen commissioner to France to represent and plead the cause of his country. Again, the white-haired statesman said goodbye to America and sailed to Europe. As soon as he arrived, he was welcomed with all possible honor. The learned called upon him, his pictures were hung in the shop windows, and his bust placed in the royal library. When he appeared on the street, a crowd gathered about the great American. He was applauded in every public resort. Franklin's reputation, said John Adams, was more universal than that of Leibniz or Newton, Frederick or Voltaire, and his character more beloved and esteemed than any or all of them. His name was familiar to government and people, to kings, courtiers, nobility, clergy, and philosophers, as well as plebeians, to such a decree that there was scarcely a peasant or a citizen, a valet de chamber, coachman or footman, a lady's chambermaid, or a scullion in the kitchen, who was not familiar with it, and who did not consider him a friend to humankind. When they spoke of him, they seemed to think he was to restore the golden age. Royalty made him welcome at court, and Marie Antoinette treated him with the graciousness which had at first won the hearts of the French to the beautiful Austrian. France made a treaty of alliance with America, and recognized her independence, February 6, 1778, which gave joy and hope to the struggling colonies. Franklin was now made minister plenipotentiary. What a change from the hated work of molding tallow candles! The great need of the colonies was money to carry on the war, and, pressed as was France in the days preceding her own revolution, when M. Necker was continually opposing the grants, she loaned our country, part of it a gift, over five million dollars, says James Parton, in his admirable life of Franklin. For this reason, as well as for the noblemen like Lafayette who came to our aid, the interests of France should always be dear to America. When the Revolutionary War was over, Franklin helped negotiate the peace, and returned to America at his own request in the fall of 1785, receiving among his farewell presents a portrait of Louis the Sixteenth, set with 408 diamonds. Thomas Jefferson became minister in his stead. When asked if he had replaced Dr. Franklin, he replied, I succeed. No one can ever replace him. He was now 79 years old. He had been absent for nine years. When he landed, cannon were fired, church bells rung, and crowds greeted him with shouts of welcome. He was at once made President of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, and at 81 a delegate to the convention that framed our Constitution, where he sat regularly five hours a day for four months. To him is due the happy suggestion, after a heated discussion, of equal representation for every state in the Senate, and representation in proportion to population in the House. At 84, in reply to a letter to Washington, he received these tender words. If to be venerated for benevolence, if to be admired for talents, if to be esteemed for patriotism, if to be beloved for philanthropy, can gratify the human mind, you must have the pleasing consolation to know that you have not lived in vain. And I flatter myself 
that it will not be ranked among the least grateful occurrences of your life to be assured that, so long as I retain my memory, you will be recollected with respect, veneration, and affection by your sincere friend, George Washington. The time for the final farewell came, April 17, 1790, near midnight, when the gentle and great statesman, doubly great because so gentle, slept quietly in death. Twenty thousand persons gathered to do honor to the celebrated dead. Not only in this country was there universal mourning, but across the ocean as well. The National Assembly of France paid its highest eulogies. By his own request, Franklin was buried beside his wife and frankly, under a plain marble slab, in Christ Church Cemetery, Philadelphia, with the words, Benjamin and Deborah Franklin, 1790. He was opposed to ostentation. He used to quote the words of Cotton Mather to him when he was a boy. On leaving the minister's house, he hit his head against a beam. Stoop, said Mather, you are young and have the world before you. Stoop as you go through it, and you will miss many hard thumps. This advice, thus beat into my head, has frequently been of use to me, and I often think of it when I see pride mortified, and misfortunes brought upon people by their carrying their heads too high. Tolerant with all religions, sweet-tempered, with remarkable tact and genuine kindness, honest, and above jealousy, he adopted this as his rule, which we may well follow, to go straight forward in doing what appears to me to be right, leave the consequences to providence. End of chapter 2